Uh, this morning, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about your identity, who you are. And uh, some of you say, I've been waiting for someone to come talk to me about that. Uh, I've been needing that discussion. And we're going to kind of deal with your identity a little bit. But let's, uh, we're going we're to be looking at a couple of passages, and I'm going to refer to some scripture, but I'm going to move kind of rapidly. So uh, if you've got your Bible and you want to look in the Gospel of John at chapter 13, that would be a great place to be. The Gospel of John, chapter 13. We're going to look at some other passages. And uh, if, you got, if you're one of those uh, phone people, you know, you, you'll be able to move a little faster than those of us that ca- kind of have to go through the pages. But we're going to look at that 13th chapter here in just a moment as we talk about your identity. Think of this. You're, you're a Baptist. And so you know what the Great Commission is, right? If someone walked up to you and said, what's the Great Commission? You could sputter something out that was somewhere close to what the Great Commission is, all right? But just as kind of laying a foundation for what we're going to talk about today, let's just think about what it says. Jesus said this, all authority is given, all authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. Well, as Jesus is saying, no matter what it looks like, I'm really in charge. I'm really working a plan. I'm really doing what I want to do. Then he said this. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then he said this teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now, that that passage says a lot of things. Number one, it it tells you what the shelf life is for the uh, Great Commission. Now, what I mean by that is, is that if you go home and you get in the refrigerator and you get that half gallon or that gallon of milk out, uh, there's a there's an expiration date on it, okay? And, man, I go by those expiration dates. And so I was, especially with something like that. And there, there's a shelf life, right? Jesus says, here's how long this commission is in effect. He said, lo, I am with you even unto the end of the world. So I guess it's still in effect, right? The Great Commission is still in effect. Now, when we look at it, We know as Baptists, when he says, make disciples, we know he's talking about uh, seek to win people to Jesus. And then we we know that it also means to, to, to bring them along in the truth of the gospel. Then there's a little phrase, though, that we often really don't stop and consider that much, and it's this little phrase here in the Great Commission. Teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you. Now, if someone walked up to you and said, okay, uh, what are the commands of Jesus? What you discover is, is that we might know a few, but actually you could get in your Bible, you could get in your New Testament, you could start in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, and you could kind of move through your Bible, and if you were astute and you focused, you would see that there are over 50 commands that Jesus makes to his disciples. All kinds of things. Uh, think just a moment. Jesus said, what's the greatest command? Well, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love the Lord. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's the second great command. But threaded all through your New Testament, there are commands that he gives us. And today, I want us to look at one of those commands. And it deals with who you are your identity in Jesus Christ, who you are. Now, I hope that you see yourself as a disciple of the Lord Jesus. I've often told people we need to be able to get up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. But there's another way at looking at whether or not we are a disciple, and that is this, being a servant of Jesus Christ. My identity and your identity as a Christian, we're to think of ourselves very directly as a servant. Let me read a little passage to you in the 20th chapter of Matthew. It's short, but Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord over them, and those who are great exercise authority 
over them. Or unless he's talking about the fact that in the world, men kind of like authority. Huh. Have you ever worked for somebody that's humble and kind? Or have you ever had a job where the person who had authority over you just sort of liked the authority too much? Yeah, I got a lot of nods on that one. But look what Jesus goes on to say about it. He says this, Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to be great among you, let him be your servant. Jesus says, that greatness is bound up in being a servant. Now, here's the interesting thing about this word servant. The word servant there, when I, when I uh, was at the university, I, I took my beginning Greek classes, and I had a little red Greek book. I should say that Greek took me rather than I took Greek, okay? But, but you start off learning a new alphabet, and you start off learning some vocabulary words, and then you get into the problem, and that's grammar, because I don't even speak English. I just speak Arcanese. And so I had real problems with the other part of that. But there, in those vocabulary words, some of the first vo vocabulary words that you learn in it is the word doulos. And doulos is the word that's translated in the scripture as the word servant. But when you study it in the classical basic sense of what the word means, it means slave in every instant. Jesus sees us as we are called to be his slave. Now, in the Greek and Roman world, the slavery wasn't like the slavery of the 17 and 1800s in this world where it was really man-stealing. It was stealing people. That slavery uh, was different from the Roman Greco slave world. But the idea was is that you served someone directly and you were under them. And Jesus calls us to be under him. Let me, t let me say this to you. I hope you can say this too. I don't mind being Jesus' servant. I don't mind being under him at all. I'm glad for him to be my king, my lord, my master, because he's my redeemer my Savior, and he's the one who meets the greatest eternal needs that I have. And Jesus said, if you want to be great, look at verse, uh, let, me, let me read verse 27. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That's the Lord Jesus being our Savior and our Lord, and he says we're called to be servants also and to be under him. Now listen, I want you to think about your identity as being a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not being, you know, when, when uh, we go along in life, we'll hear, hear some people say some things. Maybe as a, as a youngster you said this maybe to your parents, or you said it to someone who was kind of giving you too much of a push, you've, or you've heard people say this. It's my life. I'm going to live it any way I want to. Christian can't say that. Christian can't say that. It's not my life. My life is in him. My life belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ, and I look to him. Now, you may have a lot of ideas. You may be a teacher, or you might be a businessman, or you, you may be a stay-at-home mom and a homemaker. There are a lot of different things. You might be retired, or you might be real tired, but we're all, as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are supposed to be servants of the Lord. So let's take a look at a picture that he gives us of a servant in this uh, of, of a illustration of it in this 13th chapter of the Gospel of John. Now, let me kind of give you some background. The Gospel of John is signaling us some really interesting things. There are 21 chapters in the Gospel of John. Now think of this. When you look at Matthew and Mark and Luke, they're called the synoptic Gospels. They're different from the Gospel of John. And they move along and tell the story of miracles and events and 
and discourses that Jesus preached and different things that happened. But you get to John, it's got a totally different feel to it. I'm not telling you that the Gospel of John is a superior gospel to Matthew, Mark, and Luke because it's, it's the Word of God. It's all the Word of God. But John just has a whole different approach, and you'll see why when I tell you this. 21 chapters. Now think of this. Chapter 13, where we're going to read a little bit. Chapter 14, we're not going to go there today. Chapter 15, chapter 16, chapter 17, and a little bit of 18 all take place on one night. All of it. One night. The upper room, teaching about the Holy Spirit, the vine and the branches, the prayer of Jesus, and then his arrest. All of that takes place in one night. Think of that. That's, isn't that interesting? Chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Five chapters, actually over five chapters deal with one night. And it's right before his arrest. And it's like Jesus is laying out a number of things he's taught them before again. Now, it, it's sort of like the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus probably preached that sermon a number of times with a little bit different uh, emphasis here and there. Because in Luke, you'll see the, the Sermon on the Plain, and it's very similar to the Sermon on the Mount. And it's because Jesus knows that it's kind of like, it's kind of like Baptist. I always used to tell my staff, I always used to tell my staff, if we're going to announce something to the church, we've got to tell them seven times. Because, I mean, there's all these thoughts going around the room, and you, and you need to tell them seven times. Because I'll make an announcement, and then I'll be walking out the door, and someone will ask me a question, well, Pastor, when are we going to do and so-and-so? Well, I announced that just a minute ago uh, before we left the service. So when we tell them seven times, we, we get closer. Jesus knows that his followers needed to hear it more than once. And so in this, these chapters in John, he's laying out principles with them again. Well, let's see what takes place in this 13th chapter that helps us to see ourselves as servants. I want you to go out to the parking lot today thinking about the fact that you are a servant of Jesus Christ. And the only way you can be a servant of Jesus Christ is that you are a true follower of Jesus Christ, and you belong to him because you've put your faith and trust and all your hope in him to the renouncing of all others to only embracing him as Savior and Redeemer and Lord. Thirteenth chapter. They're in the upper room. He is uh, going to celebrate Passover with them, but something very interesting is going to happen. He's going to, as he celebrates Passover with them, he's going to institute what we call the Lord's Supper. Out of the Passover, remembering how they were delivered from slavery and a slave master in Egypt, he's going to lead them to see that we need to be delivered by a Redeemer and that we need to remember how that Redeemer gave his body and shed his blood so that we might have a Savior. So they're in the upper room. Now, it's a, it's a special Jewish feast. There are a number of feasts that the Jews had. This is a special feast. And so it's, it's just like, you know, uh, you don't go to Christmas dinner with your family with your pajamas on, okay? Well, some of you might. But that's not normally how we do that, okay? And so what they would do is they would go to a public bath. They'd get cleaned up, and they might get some, uh, uh, some uh, brill cream and slick it through their hair and get their hair all slicked back and... They'd be all clean and washed up, and then they would leave where, wherever they were, and they would go to, the, to the, the upper room, in this case, to celebrate the Passover with the other apostles and with the Lord Jesus. So when they get to the upper room and they walk in the door, they immediately notice something that is strange. The, the idea was is that because they would eat reclining on like, chase lounges. They, would, they weren't sitting in chairs like, like, you, like you see in the painting of, of uh, the, you know, the Lord's Supper or the Passover with Jesus and the disciples where they're all sitting on one side of the table like they're taking a team picture. That's not how that was done, okay? They reclined and they ate. And so when they came in, one of the things they wanted to do was is they, they needed to have their feet washed because out in the street, they're clean, head to toe, 
On the street, they get their feet dirty, so when they come in, they need their feet washed, and when they come in the door, there's no one to wash feet. There should be a servant there to wash feet. There's no servant there to wash feet. Well, you can see Peter come in. There's no one here to wash feet. Well, don't worry about it, boys. Just come on in. And so they come in. There's no servant to wash their feet. And they're all seated about, and the Scripture opens it up when we come to this point at verse 3 in chapter 13. And Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and when he, had he would come from God and he was going to God, he arose from the supper, and he laid aside his garments, and he took a towel, and he girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So they're all, they're all there at the supper, and Jesus gets up, walks over, takes out his outer robe, and he lays it aside, and he, and he gets a towel and ties it around his waist and tucks it in, pours some water, and Jesus starts washing their feet. Their feet are sticking off the end of those recliners, okay? And he's washing their feet. They're stunned. What is going on here? This, this is the Lord Jesus. This is our master, and he's washing our feet. What's going on here? Let's go on and see what he says. And when he came to Simon Peter, uh, Simon Peter, uh, you, you have some Simon Peters in your church. They're, all right, they're always ready to, to chime in. They're always ready to, to tell. Now, now, Peter, preeminent apostle, I'm not seeking to offend you in any way if you know who you are, but there are some folks that engage before they should engage. And he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, you are not washing my feet. Now, he said other things. Remember uh, when, when Jesus told him he was going to go to Jerusalem and be crucified? He said, no, that's not going to happen. That's in the NIV. That, that's not going to happen. Over my dead body, that's not happening. And what did Jesus say to him? Get thee behind me, Satan, or else you're getting in the way of God's plan. And he came to Simon Peter, and Simon Peter said, Lord, you're not washing my feet. And Jesus said and said, answered and said, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. You will know what? What I'm doing, what it means. Jesus said, you don't understand what it means. I'm going to show you what it means. And Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus answered and said, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Now, Peter backs down. And he says in verse 9, he says, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Wash me all over. If that's what it means, wash me all over. And Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. Now, Jesus was using the illustration of the fact that they're bathed, that they've been forgiven, they've been cleansed. See, when you come to know Christ as Savior, you, the greatest need, really, that we have is to be forgiven of our sin. The greatest need any human being has is with God to have our sins forgiven and become his child. But even after we become God's child and we belong to him, we're walking in the streets of this old world and the dirt and the grime that is around, and as we rub shoulders with the world and we move through the world, our feet get dirty, so to speak. And we need God's forgiveness again, not so that we can be saved, but that's so we can walk rightly with him. You know, it says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That, that's a passage to Christians, not to unbelievers. And sometimes we need to get some things cleaned up. Some of you feel a spiritual fog in your life. You know, there's, a, there's a lack of peace. There's, there, there's just a lack of settlement in your life as a Christian and as a believer. And as you're going along, what you might discover is, is that if you were to kind of take a log at where you're at spiritually, 
It may have been a long, long time since you've gotten alone with God and confessed your sins to him. Not just one of those, Lord, you know, dinner, dinner table confessions, Lord, thank you for the food and forgive us our sins this day. Amen, pass the mashed potato. That's not the kind of confession of sin I'm talking about. Some of you have to say, <clears throat> I can't remember the last time I got alone with God and talked about my struggles and my failures and my sins and ask him to forgive me and ask him to cleanse me and ask him to strengthen me and mature me and give me strength to overcome these things in my life. Think about it. Well, he's telling Peter, he said, I, I just need to wash your feet. I'm going somewhere with it. Verse 11. For Jesus knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. That was Judas, right? So when he had washed their feet, and taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I've done to you? Do you understand what just happened? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. And if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to also wash one another's feet. Now, some people have taken this to mean that there should be another ordinance beside the Lord's Supper, and there ought to be foot washing. That's not how we as Southern Baptists have interpreted that. What we interpret this is, is that foot washing is humble service of all kinds. Not symbolic, not symbolic humble service. Washing someone's feet would be humble service. But the idea that Jesus is giving here is not a call for us to have uh, symbolic humble servants, but to be God's humble servant. Now stay with me. Let's go back a little bit. Let's go back again. We're talking about we're disciples of the Lord Jesus. All right. We're talking about teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you. And being a servant is one of those commands. And our identity as a disciple of Jesus Christ includes the concept, the real concept, the actual concept, the functional concept, the engaged concept of being a servant of Jesus Christ. It's key, and it's extremely important. In fact, Jesus is teaching something very powerful here. Verse 15, he says, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than him who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you that do them. Powerful picture. And there's no way that you and I can get away from the idea that our identity is to be a servant of Jesus Christ. Now quickly, take your Bible if you would and turn over to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. And I want you to see something else in that 17th chapter of Luke about being a servant and it's Jesus teaching about being a servant again, and it's penetrating and it's powerful. And I hope that it will help us to kind of wrap our head around what it means to be his servant. Let's look at Jesus teaching in the 17th chapter, starting at verse 7. He says this, And which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he comes in from the field, Come at once and sit down and eat. But he will not rather say to him, Prepare something for my supper, and gird yourself, and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and afterward you will eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did the things that he was commanded him? I think not, Jesus said. So likewise you, when you have done all those things which you have been commanded and say, we are unprofitable servants, for we have done what was our duty to do. 
Now, that passage right there does something. Here's what it does. It, it, and Jesus often allows it. We're getting inside Jesus' head here. We're getting inside his head here. And what we're doing is we're getting inside Jesus' head about how he sees us as servants. Does Jesus love you? Yes, he does. Does Jesus care for you? Yes, he does. Is Jesus under any misconception about who's the Lord, though? Is he confused about who the master is? Is he confused about who has authority? No, he doesn't. Do we get confused about that sometimes? Yes, we do. We sometimes don't even see ourselves as a servant. We see ourselves as jockeying for position, getting authority, getting the high ground, lording over someone, being in charge, being the critic, analyzing things, wanting to point for others. Why doesn't somebody do something? And we find ourselves in that situation. Here, Jesus gives us a picture of how he sees us as servants. He, he gives an illustration. Here's, here's a guy who comes in from the field. He's a servant. He's been out there plowing all day. He's been pulling weeds. He's been hauling water. He's been running the animals around. He's been doing all this work. He's worn out. He walks in the door, and the master of the house says, Man, you've done such a great job today. I'm going to put a gold star on your, uh, on your report card. Is that what it says? No. Jesus says that's not what he does. He doesn't walk in the door and says, boy, thank you for doing such a great job today. Now, we're Southerners, and we live in Arkansas, and we're nice when we don't even have to be, but Jesus is trying to give us an idea of what it means for us to be a servant. So Jesus says, that he, does he say, come in and sit down and eat? He says, no. He says, go wash up and fix my dinner. And after you fix my dinner, I'll eat. And after I've eaten, you can eat. Look at the very last part of that again. So likewise, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what our duty was to do. Now, what's he saying? What does he mean, unprofitable? I, I like to use the word break even. I did what the Lord told me to do. I don't get a do old star for that. I'm just a break even servant. I didn't fail, but I wasn't necessarily stellar. I didn't go the extra mile. You know, looking into the mind of the Lord Jesus and looking into the mind of the Lord Jesus about what makes a great servant is very important. And one of the ways that you and I can express our service to the Lord is through the life of your church. Now, a lot of folks have a low view of the church. I want you to know for 2,000 years, there are folks who have had a low view of the church. And in 21st century America, uh, there, in the minds of many people, there's a low view of the church. Like, like the church is sort of something that man thought up and drummed up and, and that uh, is really something that's man-centered and man-created. But the church is the bride of Christ, and the local church, and Rye Hill Baptist Church is a local church, the local church is God's design, God's process, and his desire is for you and I to serve him through the churches that we're a part of and to be a servant. Think about all the things that we've talked about just this morning about being a servant and how you can be engaged in the life of your church, and I'm sure many of you are. Many of us have strengths and abilities that have been given to us by the Lord. And often we give those strengths and ability to everything but the local church. It's sort of like the leftovers of our life. If there's anything left over, I'll give that energy. I'll give that time. I'll give that ability. I'll make that sacrifice if there's anything left. And most of the time, there's not much left. There's not much left. The church is flawed, I know. Your church is flawed. All churches are flawed. we got a bunch of sinners in a divine institution. And so it has flawed. I know some of you have had bad experiences with churches. And that happens with a bunch of humans when we're involved and we're not looking to the Lord. But the church is Jesus' thing. Look long and hard at the Scripture. 
It's like a colony of the kingdom of God setting on this earth and citizens of the kingdom. It's where we worship, proclaim, make disciples, minister, do missions, and reach out to the world, being the church and being servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go back just for a second. 13th chapter of John. I'm not going to read it. Just go back in your mind. Go back in your mind. Upper room. Jesus washes their feet. They leave there that night. They go down to the Garden of Yosemite. Jesus is arrested the next day. He's crucified. The unfolding of the church takes place in the book of Acts. Maybe months down the line, maybe, maybe a year or two down the line, maybe some of the disciples are gathered around. They're talking together. And you know, I wonder in one of those conversations, if one of the disciples might have said, you remember that night in the upper room? I wish, I wish I would have gotten up and washed everybody's feet before Jesus did. I wish, I wish I'd have been that kind of servant then. I wish I had done that. You know, one day there may be hours of regret where we look back over the opportunities and the giftedness that God has given us that we didn't use, and we might say, when I was able, I wish I would have done that. I wish I had seen myself as a disciple. I had seen myself as a servant of Jesus Christ. And the only way you can be a servant it's to know him as your Savior. And there may be those who are here today that you've been thinking maybe for weeks or months or even longer about turning your heart and your life over to Jesus Christ, asking him to forgive you of your sin, coming under him, his lordship, making, taking steps to move to take your life and put your life in his hands as your Redeemer and your Savior. And if that's true, I would encourage you this morning to surrender to him and just make him the Lord of your life. I remember when I was a young boy and God was dealing with me about coming to know Jesus Christ as Savior, I resisted. I, I resisted on a number of occasions when God's Spirit was convicting me of my sin. I resisted. Later in life, I looked back over the years and I asked myself, why did I resist? Now, at the time, I was telling myself I was shy. You can tell I'm shy. But when I really analyzed it, you know what it was? There's the kingdom of Dale. And who sits on the throne of the kingdom of Dale? Dale. And if I receive Jesus as my Savior, I have to get off the throne. And Jesus sits on the throne of my life. You may be resisting becoming his disciple, his follower, his servant, receiving him as Savior, because you're really struggling with giving over your kingdom. Let me tell you, he's a much better king than you are. He's the Lord of glory. He's the king of kings. There are others here today, maybe the, the need in your life is to surrender. Maybe you've been kind of putting the brakes on, following Christ. Maybe there are areas that God's been calling you to. And you've just, you've just stiffened up, held back. And maybe you've pointed at others at hurt, resistance. Maybe you've pointed at other issues that, uh, have hurt you. And, uh, you know, me being hurt, you being hurt, that, that's a, that's a painful thing. But serving Jesus Christ trumps all that stuff. All of it. We belong to Him and to His glory his purpose. Let's bow our heads just a moment. Can we do that? And with our heads bowed this morning, maybe God's speaking to your heart about knowing Christ, receiving the Lord, and here's what we're going to do this morning, a little, little different this morning. God's dealing with your life today. Just while the piano plays and Christians are praying, I'm going to encourage you to make a response and a decision to say, I'm going to give my life to Christ today. 
I've, I've thought about it. I've put it off. And it is. It's about who's Lord of my life. And I'm going to, I'm going to step down. I'm going to step away. I'm going to ask Jesus to take the lordship of my life and be my Savior and my King. I want to become his follower. And you might say, I'd like to have the eternal life and forgiveness, but I don't want to go that far. Then you can't come. Then you can't come. But if God's dealing with your life to come, receive Christ as your Savior, surrender to him, receive him into your life, begin a new direction. Guys on the staff and men of the church are standing here at the front right now. They're coming. And if you'd like to just slip out and come right in this moment, just come. They're waiting for you. They'd, they'd love to greet you. They'd love for you to come. There may be others here this morning. While you're praying right there, maybe there's some business you need to do with God about serving Him, being His servant, being His disciple. And Jesus has not been the very center of your energies as His follower. Why don't you ask Him to forgive you today and open up your life to him and say, Lord, just take control of my life in a fresh, new, and powerful way. Lord, do it. I pray you would work in me in my life today. And if you need to rededicate that life to Christ and you feel that's a step you really want to take, you can slip out and come and pray with one of these guys at the front. We'll wait for you. Just slip out of the seat where you're at. Folks will let you out and just come in this moment. You may be here today and God's been leading you to Rye Hill as a home church, as a place for you to be. And you would like to come and be a part of this church family. These guys can help you know what you need to do to become part of the church family. Just slip out and come and we'll wait for you just for a few moments.